relationship. Those bonded still to this president and to this administration and now bonded to this sacrifice. Proceed at your own peril. John McCain may still hear the applause of small crowds. He has somehow inured himself to the hypocrisy and the tragedy of a man who considers himself the ultimate realist, now courting the votes of those who support a government that tells visitors to the Grand Canyon that the Grand Canyon was created by the Great Flood, that Mr. McCain is selling himself off to the irrational right, parcel by parcel, like some great landowner facing bankruptcy. Seems to be obvious to everybody but himself, or maybe it is obvious to him and he no longer cares. But to the rest of you in the Republican Party, we need you to speak up right now in defense of your country's most precious assets, the lives of its citizens who are in harm's way. If you do not, you are not serving this nation's interests, nor your own, indeed. Last November should have told you this. The opening of the new Congress tomorrow and Thursday should tell you this again. Next time, those missing Republicans on Capitol Hill will be you. And to the Democrats now yoked to the helm of this sinking ship, you proceed at your own peril as well. President Bush may not be very good at reality, but he and Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rove are still gifted at letting American troops be killed and then turning their deaths to their own political advantage. The equation is simple. The country does not want more troops in Iraq. It wants fewer. Go and make it happen, or go and look for other work. Yet you Democrats must assume that even if you take the most obvious of courses now and you cut off funding for this war, Mr. Bush will ignore you for as long as possible, or will find the money elsewhere, or will spend the more money, the money meant to protect the troops and repurpose it to keep as many troops there as long as he can keep them there. Because that's what this is all about, is it not, Mr. Bush? That is what this sacrifice has been for to continue this senseless war. You have dressed it up in the clothing first of a hunt for weapons of mass destruction, then of liberation, then of regional imperative, then of oil prices, and now in these new terms of sacrifice. It's like a damned game of color forms, isn't it, sir? This senseless, endless war. But it has not been senseless in two ways, at least. It has succeeded, Mr. Bush, has it not, in enabling you to deaden the collective mind of this country to the pointlessness of endless war against the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time. It has gotten many of us used to the idea, the virtual white noise of conflict far away of the deaths of young Americans, of vague sacrifice for some fluid cause, too complicated to be interpreted, except in the terms of the very important sounding, but ultimately meaningless phrase, the war on terror. And the war in Iraq's second accomplishment, your second accomplishment, sir, is to have taken money out of the pockets of every American, even out of the pockets of the dead soldiers on the battlefield and their families, and to have given that money to the war profiteers. Because if you sell the army a thousand Humvees, you can't sell them any more until the first thousand have been destroyed, can you? The servicemen and women are ancillary to the equation. This is about the planned obsolescence of ordnance, isn't it, Mr. Bush? And the building of detention centers and the design of a $125 million courtroom complex at Gitmo complete with restaurants. At least the war profiteers have made their money, sir. And we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. You have insisted, Mr. Bush, that we must not lose in Iraq, that if we don't fight them there, we will fight them here, as if the corollary were somehow that if by fighting them there, we will not have to fight them here. And yet you have remade our country, and not remade it for the good, on the premise that we need to be ready to fight them here anyway and always. In point of fact, even if the civil war in Iraq somehow ended tomorrow, and the risk to Americans there ended with it, we would have already suffered a defeat. Not fatal, not world-changing, not but for the lives lost of enduring consequence. But this country has already lost in Iraq, sir. Your policy in Iraq has already had its crushing impact on our safety here. You have already fomented new terrorism and new terrorists. You have already stoked paranoia. You have already pitted Americans one against the other. We will have to live with it. We will have to live with what of the fabric of our nation you have already sacrificed. The only object still admissible in this debate is the quickest and safest exit for our people there. But you, and soon, Mr. Bush, it will be you and you alone, still insist otherwise. And our sons and daughters and fathers and mothers will be sacrificed there tonight, sir, so that you can say you did not lose in Iraq. 
Our policy in Iraq has been criticized for being indescribable, for being inscrutable, for being ineffable. But it is all too easily understood now. First, we sent Americans to their deaths for your lie, Mr. Bush. Now we are sending them to their deaths for your ego. If what is reported is true, if your decision is made and the sacrifice is ordered, take a page instead from the man at whose funeral you so eloquently spoke this morning, Gerald Ford. Put pragmatism and the healing of a nation ahead of some kind of misguided vision. Atone. Sacrifice, Mr. Bush? No, sir, this is not sacrifice. This has now become human sacrifice. And it